Right. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to this um, second webinar in the CAPSI Lunchtime webinar series, um, in which we are showcasing uh, research from teams across the centre um, and across our main research theme areas. Um, so for today, to get started, um, I'll just briefly introduce our contributors. They are uh, Professor Matthew Ridd, who is a GP and a Professor of Primary Health Care at the Centre for Academic Primary Care. And Dr. Jonathan Banks, who is a senior researcher at the National Institute for Health Research Applied Research Collaboration, West, NIHR, Arc West. So thank you both for joining us today. And uh, just simple kind of outline, um, Matt and John are going to uh, do some presentation slides and talk to you about research findings from the Skin and Allergy Research Group at the Centre for Academic Primary Care, uh, focusing on the question, how we can look after children's eczema better. You can, as uh, people who are attending today, thank you very much for joining. You can post questions in the chat at any time from now um, until later in the, in, in the webinar when we will be doing a question and answer session. So questions in the chat, please. And then uh, Matt and John will pick these up at the end uh, and go through them. Uh, I think that's it. We're going to experiment with trying um, a poll or possibly two. So we'll see how that goes. Um, so I'm now going to hand over to, to Matt. So thanks, Matt. Great, thank you. Uh, this talk should be so good, we've actually got two title slides, so I'll move on to the next one. Um, I don't know, should we try the first poll? Would that be all right, Helen? Because I'm just going to enlarge a little bit on how you introduce myself, and John and I will introduce up a bit further. Um, but what would really help me, or I'm curious to know, is, is, is who you are. So if your screen is like my screen, you've got a little box that's popped up in front of my slide, and it says, who are you? Um, I realise that for some of these categories, you might you might be in both. You might be someone who has eczema and looks after someone with eczema. But if you wouldn't mind um, choosing the box that you think is best representations of you today, then that would be um, that, that would be great. Um, I think it's also hopefully of interest to you to know who, who who's sitting in the audience with you virtually. Um, now, if that works, hopefully Helen will be able to share the results with us. Okay, that's great. So hopefully you can all see a box like I can that shows, uh, um, so I'm, I'm not sure the actual numbers of people in the call, but just over half of you are a parent or care of a child with eczema. Um, and the next are some uh, research and clinical colleagues. Um, some people have eczema themselves, and then uh, there's another category of other. So um, it's not the, the most carefully designed survey, but that's really helpful. Thank you. It's, it's nice to know who, who's joined us today. So um, uh, Helen's already told you a little bit about myself and, and John, um, and this is about the first slide, I think, if every list to talk is to first of all find out, you know, what, what's in it for the person talking, okay? So we don't have any commercial interests from this. Um, it's just really an opportunity for tell us a little bit about research that we do to thank those of you who might have been involved in it. Um, there is an invitation to get involved in uh, a patient engagement, but no obligation. Um, if I have any competing interests, it's the fact that I've got uh, members of my family have eczema as well and food allergy. Uh, John, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Matt. So I'm um, John, John Banks, and I'm, as Helen said, I'm a researcher. I'm based at Art West, but I also work with the uh, primary care unit that Matt's based in. So I do qualitative research, which effectively means talking to people. We do a lot of in-depth interviews and sometimes observations to find, um, find out about people's experiences of a condition or delivering a new kind of treatment, those kind of uh, approaches to research. And I've worked with Matt on a number of his studies and I'll fill you in on that, our findings as we go through the morning. Great. So John is one of a number of colleagues uh, who've helped me conduct the research. I just represent the team. Um, John and I are both speaking to you from Bristol. Um, there's a picture there if you don't remember what Bristol looks like, and there's the building that uh, the centre is housed in. Okay, so broadly, this is what we're going to try and cover, and I framed it in terms of questions. 
Um, if you like, there might be a bit of self-justification about why we're doing the research. Um, I want to try and explain to you why we've done the research we've done um, and indeed how patients have influenced that. Um, and then you may be more interested in what the actual research says uh, in relation to how you look after your own uh, children. Um, and then talking a little bit about ongoing work. So there won't be results from that, but the kind of things that are ongoing that, again, you might be interested in uh, supporting or taking part in. So let's start at the beginning. Um, the majority of you uh, will know either by virtue of clinical training um, or by virtue of a, a suffering or having someone with eczema yourself what the condition is. And you'll probably recognize these typically sort of red inflammatory lesions that you get uh, around the elbows and the knees, uh, often seen on the children as well uh, when they first present in infancy. And most children do develop eczema in the first two years of life. You can get it later on and it can develop later in adulthood as well. The reason for the brick wall though is twofold. Um, first of all, because um, one way of thinking about what the problem with the skin and eczema is to think of it as a brick wall, where you've got the bricks as the individual cells in the outer layer of the skin, and, and the mortar or the cement between the, uh, between the bricks and the, in, in the skin doesn't work as well. So it doesn't, it's not, a good, not as effective as it in, is in normal skin in terms of uh, retaining moisture and keeping uh, things that are outside outside. Um, I also think of it in terms of a brick wall. So if you're struggling yourself with eczema or uh, with your charge, it can feel like hitting a bit of a brick wall. And if you go into Boots or any chemist and look at the range of different moisturizers, for example, that can feel like a bit of a wall as well. So I, I think that's a helpful way of thinking about um, a starting place, if you like. So this slide split into two halves. So on the left-hand side, we've got what, what, what is called a treatment escalator, and it's based on what the NICE guidance uh, recommends. Um, so it divides essentially eczema into three, three levels of severity. It's fairly crude, but it's a, a helpful way of thinking of simplifying things mild, moderate, severe, and then as the inc uh, severity increases, and so you're, you're thinking of different treatment options, if, if you like, more, um, more invasive or aggressive treatment options. But I think the key thing here is to recognize that um, emollients and moisturizers uh, are recommended in all levels of severity, um, as are uh, topical corticosteroids for the majority of children, all but the very mildest extra will need some and you have increasing strengths of topical corticosteroids in line of what you need. The majority of our research and talk is going to focus on those two key treatments. Um, uh, I work with colleagues who uh, uh, think a good message for people looking after eczema is to think about two treatments use well, moisturizers and topical corticosteroids, but there may be other treatments that are appropriate for you or your child, particularly if you're towards the more severe end of the spectrum. Um, but most children can be managed effectively with those treatments because 90% of children have mild or moderate eczema and really should be within the remit of, of, of your GP to look after well. Um, and it's a really common condition. I've got a statistic there, overall, over one in 10 consultations are for skin and a large, uh, large proportion of those are for eczema. Um, and so many people uh, won't get anywhere near a dermatologist. And if the care is good, you should be able to be managed well in primary care. Hence the focus of our research in primary care as a GP. The challenges is that, you, and, and you may experience this or bring up in the questions, is that care isn't always that good in primary care. Um, being a GP is, is, is one of the best but the hardest jobs to do. Um, dermatology training historically hasn't been very good either as a medical student or when you qualify and do all the training to become a GP. Um, that's made worse by the fact that a lot of the common skin problems we treat in primary care, excellent being a very good example, isn't necessarily the focus of a lot of dermatology research, which can be more sort of cell or lab based or into more new conditions or things that need to be researched, but don't address the everyday needs that certainly I see in my patients. And historically, some of the research that's been conducted hasn't been as good as it could be because it hasn't involved everyone that's interested. So I, I may think I need what I think I need what, you know, I may think I know what needs to be researched. Um, but only by really working with patient partners to help prioritise those, um, those research needs and by working with uh, methodologists such as John, who bring particular skills and people who are good at running trials and doing statistics, only then can we really conduct good research that gives us decent answers. So the picture on the top left there is the fact that sometimes there's not a very good fit between the need and, and what you get in primary care and certainly the need in terms of research. And the picture on the right is really about trying to put patients at the centre of things, really. And in this case, focusing on children with eczema. 
Um, I think I'm going to hand over to John now, who's going to talk a little bit about the fit or people's experience of accessing care and uh, primary care. Thanks, Matt. So uh, the first uh, bit of work that I'm going to talk about is uh, some, some research that was done as part of the Apache study. And this was to develop a written action plan for eczema. And I'm going to talk more about that later. But as part of this work, we wanted to find out people's experiences of um, <clears throat> how they kind of managed eczema, both from the GP perspective and from the patient. So we interviewed patients and we interviewed GPs and, and some other healthcare professionals as well. So this work kind of highlighted that, that GPs were confident in diagnosing eczema. That part of it wasn't an issue. But there, there was uncertainty about, around prescribing emollients and, and the topical corticosteroids. In terms of uh, prescribing emollients, it was more around the kind of trial and error aspect of, of because there's so many different types and, um, and different with and the emollients have different qualities that, 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 that they weren't sure where to start or what was the best course of action so there's trial and error which is quite an unsatisfactory way of kind of managing a condition with something that characterized the the uh, gp and patient encounter there for the topical corticosteroids they were comfortable with the milder versions but gps were, were less confident when prescribing the more potent or even moderate uh, corticosteroids that was partly to do with their uncertainty, but also to do with their kind of, there was a perception from them that parents were fearful of this, this type of treatment. And so that, that, in, that kind of influenced the way they, their kind of confidence in prescribing it as well. And overall, there was a lack of, um, as Matt has already highlighted, they, they did highlight the fact that they, they felt there was a lack of dermatological training in their primary care experiences. And if you just click on that, so, <clears throat> you know, when we looked at what patients said and when patients' parents, when we looked at what GPs said, we could see a kind of a kind of gap between um, the two perspectives, the two the two experiences of the of the kind of the appointment or the consultation between parents and um, and GPs. Parents would often highlight that they wanted more information about the cause or you know, why, why their child had eczema, whereas for GPs, they saw it as an incurable condition. So their focus tended to be on management rather than the cause. And so, and then for parent, for patients and parents, they wanted to express their kind of experiences of how, of their, for their child of having this condition, which had huge, significant psychosocial um, impact, you know, the, 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 just in terms of managing, applying emollients, the kind of impact on everyday life, things like just, you know, taking part in swimming, taking part in other physical activities. Whereas for GPs that felt out of their control. So they tended to focus on well, what's going on with the skin. Patients and parents tended to think in terms, they, they wanted to talk about what they saw as natural solutions, things that they could buy over the counter. Whereas for GPs, the focus tended to be on how can we kind of manage this through, through prescriptions. So there was what we identified, the, what we called a dissonance, a kind of a different differential perspective between GPs and parents in, in terms of managing eczema. And this, this just didn't help with uh, the decision making or, or um, one of the key finding was that parents and patients didn't feel involved in the decision making which when it comes down to something with so many different treatments and um, where or, you know you have to find the solution through trial and error when you feel that there's this gap there this does this is very kind of counterproductive in getting to the right solution so this was a kind of an important finding in terms of developing solutions to ma eczema management and i'm going to hand back to you now, Matt. Great, thank you, John. So I wonder how many of you that experience rings true, and you may say, well, why do research when we know that? Well, the point is this research hasn't been done, to, and so do, until you do these sort of, you know, very systematic and careful work, speaking to parents and exploring these issues, until it's kind of out there, you can't then convince people that need to pay attention about the need to address some of these issues. And one thing that does run through, I think, some of the research is the need for involvement in decision making. So hopefully we'll pick that back up again and start to answer what we've done to try and address some of these issues. OK, so I've got a question for you. Where do you get your information from? Um, I've got three uh, images here, possible sources. 
um, uh, invited or not, you may get uh, advice from your neighbour, or it could be a relative about what you should do or how you should approach your uh, child's or your own eczema. Um, there's plenty of news articles out there, either in the mainstream press um, uh, or on television. And then, of course, the internet is probably the most readily accessible go-to information. Um, and there's certainly no end of misinformation out there as well. Um, the other theme that runs through this talk really is the fact that though we do do and have led on lots of good research here in Bristol, we wouldn't have been able to do it without some key colleagues. And one of my key colleagues is uh, uh, Professor Miriam Sound, another academic GP press in, in Southampton. And she's published a couple of papers around uh, the, the, the challenges that parents have found around this information, particularly looking around the internet. You know, the, the, the papers are there if you, if you Google those uh, details there you'll be able to find them but the titles tell you really what they what the messages are from there so if you've looked online it is a challenge to know what to uh, what to believe and what not to um, lots of people are seeking cures um, uh, but my advice to you would be that if anyone's promising a cure um, as in most things in life if it's too good to be true that's probably the case um, so again, what we're going to do about it? Well, I'm going to give you a resource at the end, which is uh, independent of uh, people who need to sell things or make money from you or biased in any other way, where you can get some good, reliable information on the internet. Okay, so hopefully we've convinced you a little about a bit about the need. You know, most most eczema being diagnosed, looked after in primary care, most should be able to be, um, and the need for research to help support that. Um, but if there are lots of things we need to research and better understand to improve the care of children with eczema, then how do we decide what to do first? So this picture here is from a research exercise that I was involved in uh, over well, around 10 years ago, actually, where uh, instead of me or John or anyone else who's interested in doing research decides what we look at, we actually went and spoke to the patients and the clinicians who look after people to say, what are the top priorities here? And in total, there are 14 priorities, and I've just picked out four here that we've uh, began to or started to, uh, or in some way are addressing through our research. So the top question was around, if you're going to use a moisturiser, which is the best one to use? Um, how do you best use topical corticosteroids? Because safety is often the concern, as John's highlighted, both amongst parents and indeed uh, GPs. Um, what role, if any, does food allergy tests have in terms of helping look after your child's skin? Um, and what about the role of skin infections? So I'm going to try and talk a little bit to those questions in the research we've done. OK, so emollients or moisturisers, there's not really a distinction between the two. Emollients just tends to be a medical name for, for whatever you put on your skin to try and um, help restore what is a, essentially a, a, a dysfunctional defective skin barrier if you've got eczema. And there are three main types. You probably already know this. So you can use some as soap substitutes because some soaps, particularly if they're perfume, can be quite drying or irritant to the skin. Um, you can buy things passively that you pour into the bath that are meant to help moisturize the skin. And I'm going to come on to you, uh, come on to a study we did looking at the effectiveness of that. But for most people, moisturizer things you apply directly to the skin, both to help try and restore some moisture in the skin, but also potentially to act as a protective barrier to things that might irritate it. The problem is, though, if you're trying to decide which moisturiser to use for the skin, um, and most, many of them can be used in all three ways, so you can use them as a, a soap substitute or even uh, sort of uh, rub them together and mix them in the bath uh, or put them on the skin directly, is that there are lots of different types. Um, and broadly, they fall into four main types that run through from lotions, which is on the left hand side of this picture, through to ointments, and they Differ in several different ways, but the main characteristic really is in their thickness. It's essentially in the ratio of the water to uh, oil in them. Um, uh, but uh, a recent systematic review essentially identified no good research to guide whether anyone was better than another. Evidence that's uh, helpful in terms of symptoms, but 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 not not really other good good evidence, which is surprising given how long these have been around and how core cool they are to the treatment of eczema. So I'm going to first of all address bath additives. Should you buy them if you had them previously or if you've asked your GP about them chances are uh, they won't prescribe them to you um, and that's not because they're mean and trying to deny you something it's essentially because this study we did called the bath study didn't show that they added anything so if you're using moisturizers well on the skin in a sub soap substitute or even in the bath pouring this additional uh, moisturizer into the bath doesn't do anything we randomized 580 over 580 children the mean age of five years to bath additives or or usual care um, or usual care or bath additives in addition to, to, to good usual care 
uh, and we looked at a patient reported outcome of eczema severity and we didn't see any difference uh, over the follow-up period uh, and this was a decent well-conducted study and it made it into the BMJ and had a lot of media attention at the time so probably not worth investing your time or money because you'd have to buy it yourself these days in that but it is worth using moisturizers as far as we know from the evidence um, but how have you decided which moisturizer to use we did a survey a few years ago so this is a brilliant science, but it's a helpful pointer and again may reflect your own experience. Um, of 170 parents and carers of children with eczema filled, filled on our survey, over a third had tried at least 10 different ones. Um, and when we asked them how they chose which ones to try or which ones they ended up with, they talked about a trade-off between whether it seemed to work and whether they liked it. Because if you're putting this thing on your or your child's skin several times a day, um, uh, particularly if you've got a child who's not that keen to have it applied to their skin, and then that's a key consideration. And the main thing they were looking for from the moisturiser was to reduce it, try and prevent flares, and inflamed areas of skin, and reduce the soreness. If you ask your GP, or at least until recently, what they'd recommend, they'd probably say an ointment. And this is, a, uh, again, a, a very sort of crude survey of uh, GPs attending a conference last year before we presented the results of a study I'm going to come on to about which is the most effective. Um, and although some people thought maybe lotions, creams or gels, which are those uh, three of those four types I spoke to earlier might be best, majority of people thought probably ointments, which are more like the kind of Vaseline type moisturizers. But GPs are guided what to prescribe by things called formularies. So these are just documents um, that different parts of the country draw up usual consultation with the local dermatology department about what I or other GPs should be prescribing. But they vary across England. So if you look across England, there are 72 different formularies. Between them, they recommend over 100 different emollients. And not only do they contradict each other in terms of what they recommend, some of them have uh, documents alongside them. We call them guidelines rather than formularies, and sometimes there are even contradictions within those uh, within those areas. So if you're confused, if your GP is confused, it's not really surprising really because I don't really see the need to produce sense to different formularies when there's not good evidence for one emollient over another until now. So I'm going to tell you a little bit now on this slide about the study. It might just take me a, a minute or two to go through it. So what we did is we recruited children in the Bristol, Southampton and uh, Nottingham areas uh, to take part in this trial where we asked them to be willing to be randomised to one of these four main types, either a lotion, cream, gel or ointment to use as their main moisturiser. Um, well, we actually wanted to, we actually followed people up for, for 52 weeks, but we asked them to try and stick with this moisturiser uh, for the first 16 weeks. Um, and they had moderate severity eczema. Um, and uh, I'm going to have to praise you quite a lot to keep this talk uh, uh, consumable, but uh, essentially this graph shows you all you need to know. So each of those coloured lines uh, represents child, the average, the average uh, eczema severity scores for the children who were put into those different groups. And as you would expect at the beginning, if we've done this study properly, they've got a similar sort of score at the beginning. But as you look over the 16 weeks, there's no difference. Everyone's eczema seems to get a little bit better but there's certainly no standout emollient there. It seems like they all seem to do the job. There are lots of different ways to look at whether a moisturizer works. Um, we looked at them uh, in terms of how the skin looked, uh, whether it affected, seemed to affect the child's quality of life, um, and other ways of looking at eczema severity. Um, we didn't see any difference either in terms of how often you had to put it on or whether you use less topical corticosteroid. Uh, but you may have experienced yourself if you use moisturisers that you can get symptoms such as stinging and so on with them. I think the reason that many GPs in that earliest, you know, simple survey we did recommend ointments because the conventional wisdom is that um, ointments uh, may cause less stinging. And we found that in our study, but otherwise there wasn't a lot of difference. Overall, a third of people in this trial had one or more problems with these different moisturisers. So if you get problems, it's not uncommon. Uh, but it's not necessarily unique to that type of moisturiser. So you may say, well, that's all very good, Dr. Ridd, uh, but does that mean we can, you know, we only need one type or the, they're all the same? Uh, very much not so, because uh, fortunately, due to the problem with people like uh, John from the outset, we realised the numbers weren't going to necessarily tell us everything. So I'm going to hand back over to John to talk about the qualitative research in this trial. Thanks, Matt. So one of the 
so Matt's already mentioned about the kind of the way that people reflect on the emollients and we've tried to look at look at their experiences through the lenses of either a, a both effectiveness and acceptability so how comfortable a thing uh, an emollient was to use how the impact on it on their kind of clothing their day-to-day -day activities but also the effectiveness how, how kind of um how well it worked for them so we interviewed a sample of well two samples of people really from each uh, emollient group that, that so for each of the four emollients we interviewed a sample of people near the start of their treatment program around about the four week mark and then we interviewed them again at the at the end of the period to find out whether they, partly one of the things we looked at, at the end was whether they continue continue with the emollient that they've been assigned to so the the, the the findings in many ways mirrored the main trial. We, we found no clear preference. We find that experience of using each emollient type varied within. So for each, for so for people using an ointment, some people found it effective. Some people found it not effective, and that that was the case for each of the four types. People valued and and in terms of how they evaluate an emollient they they focused on both effectiveness and acceptability both were very important but effectiveness was the primary driver of preference and you can see that in the in the quote at the top though well you can see it in both quotes really where the person first person parent is saying we like the way it went on we found it much more easy to use but it just didn't, it had the effect was was not good on the skin. So they didn't feel they could carry on using that. Whereas the, the one then for the, the one, the second quote is saying that the improvement, there was no real improvement in terms of the skin, but the, if the, the comfort in using it, the acceptability of the emollient was, uh, was, was, was much better. And so they decided to keep on, uh, to stick with that one. It was, um, it was being a much more nicer emollient to use. And so if you could just click on a, one map. So, it, you know, as I've, the, the real key here is the variation across the emollient types. There is a perception that the thinner types, the thinner emollients are easier to, to apply. <clears throat> And the, the thicker ones may, might be more effective, but they're much harder to, to, to put on and use. But this didn't this didn't really pan out either because people found for some people a thicker emollient meant meant that they didn't have to apply it so much. Some people, as as you see in the quote there, whereas they found the thinner one easier to apply, they had to do it more, or they felt they had to do it more. And so it just um, so there was no clear the pattern other than the variation in experience between individual families, between individual children and the different emollient types. And this reinforced the message in terms of the best type of emollient is the one that works for the parent and the child. And the, the key to finding that the best type of emollient is to develop the dialogue between the GP and the parent patient so that people become more involved in the process and more engaged. One of the things that I haven't put on the slide, but that, that did come up, was the for, for a number of people taking part in the trial, the, 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 which involved completing questionnaires, it involved some generic information about emollients and about eczema. It was a kind of bit of a refresher in terms of how to manage the condition. And so again, this emphasized the need for uh, you know to, to build communication between the GP and parent and patient. And uh, back to you, Matt. Uh, thank you, John. So I, I admit when, when we first saw the results, I think some of us were a little bit disappointed that we find that one was any better than the other, because it's nice to be able to provide, you know, evidence that actually if you start here, you might do better. But having had time to absorb this and share this with colleagues and uh, again, absorb the findings of John's work with, uh, with, with, with his colleague Eileen Sutton, we think actually it's quite liberating. So essentially we think this supports choice. So. The, the formularies that I talked about earlier, um, they should support all or at least one of each type uh, available for the GP to prescribe. Um, but the research isn't much use if it doesn't get into practice and, and, and to both get it into practice and help people consume it, we've developed this uh, decision aid. So 
you can access this web address at the top there. I'll, I'll give it again at the end if you don't have a chance to write it down. But essentially, it's a very, we try to keep it a fairly simple two page document that talks about the four different types. Because another thing that came out from our research was that people weren't necessarily aware there were four different types. People talk about creams, but you use that in quite a generic sense. They're not talking about a cream cream, they're talking about all the different types of moisturizers, but there are these four types. And then talking through what the pros and cons are. And there are lots of consideration that, again, you might be already aware of whether it's time of the year, you might not like a heavy ointment when it's hot weather at the moment, um, or different body sites, or indeed as the child gets older, moving from, uh, if their eczema persists, moving from childhood through into adolescence. So if you've got time after the year, well, then I'd recommend you download and have a look at that, and, and any feedback around it would be very welcome. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the other biggie uh, that we're going to, um, that we're focusing on for this talk, which is topical corticosteroids. Um, so what I do, first of all, would you mind seeing if that second poll will work for us, uh, Helen? Two reasons, again, because I'm curious to see what your perspectives are, and also helps just break the talk up a bit rather than me and John talking. I haven't got a picture yet, Helen. It worked so well first time, I thought. It really we were... did, <laughs> and now it's just showing me the last poll, so I'm just see if I can... Uh... What do I need to do? Oh, I see. We could do that again, but I don't think people no, will. No, it's fine. Things. I've got it now. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you should have a little box on your screen like me. It says topical corticosteroid use. Do you worry about using topical corticosteroids on your or your child's skin? So I realize, again, it's not the perfect question because you may feel different about your skin if you've got eczema to your child's skin. But um, perhaps just be consistent with with how you kind of assigned yourself early, whether if someone with eczema or a care or someone with eczema. And, and 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 choose, choose, choose a box um again maybe not the best just question but it just gives us a bit, bit of a feel for uh, what your thoughts are i don't know if you can monitor how many responses you got there helen decide when to uh, flash up the findings okay that's interesting. So again, hopefully you've got a box on your skin with a result there. So the majority of people sit in that yes, a little box. Um, and then um, obviously you've got a fair number of people split between yes, I worry a lot and don't know. Um, and the smallest proportion of those who, who don't don't worry. That might be because they're um, using very mild steroids or infrequently or don't, or don't need them at all. Or maybe they've, they've had some good advice around it. So uh, that's, re that's really, really helpful. Because yeah, if you look in the literature, around top of corticosteroid use and most of the genus is done in specialist settings by dermatologists so they're not necessarily typical of the of the average person who's looked after by their gp they they write and talk a lot about corticosteroid phobia so it's important to be clear first that we're talking about corticosteroids these aren't anabolic steroids they're not the kind of steroids that people take to build up muscles the, these are these are essentially sort of uh, hormones that your body naturally produces to dampen inflammation um and when people talk about corticosteroid phobia, I, I think that's unfair because um, phobia is an irrational fear, whereas I think there is basis for people to be worried. Uh, so historically, mainly, uh, problems were uh, the problems were mainly historical for when these uh, products were first available and people used them in high doses for long periods and sensitive body size. And you do get problems potentially from doing that. But usually we're talking about, as I say, high strengths and sensitive areas for, for weeks at a time. Um, and the dermatologists, again, I've done a lot of this research with, talk about the main uh, problem or side effect from topical corticosteroids use these days is from underuse rather than overuse. So it's worth just just uh, kind of getting that out there, really. Um, so this is a picture, um, and it relates to a review that um, colleagues in Nottingham and Southampton led on, looking around um, best ways and safety of topical corticosteroids. And I don't have time to go through all these different boxes, but essentially what I'm just trying to show you here is there are lots of different ways to think about which is the best topical corticosteroid and how best to use them. Um, so it would vary according to older versus newer ones, whether you're using it when you get red skin or whether you're trying to use it to, to avoid inflammation to begin with uh, and so on. So um, again, these this this review is, is available online. I think I'll give the reference on the next slide on the Cochrane Library, which is always a good source of information. And they do put patient summaries, plain English summaries on there. So it's a bit more digestible. So if you're going to go for, for one source of information, independent of a resource I showed you earlier, then the Cochrane Library is a good place to go. 
So this is a one slide summary of a, of a review that took months. Um, um, the disappointing thing about it is that although we found lots of studies, over 100 studies involving lots of people, over, uh, over 8,000 different people, um, the evidence really still wasn't that good. Um, most commonly, um, they were done in children, but they're fairly short in duration. So if you're looking after your child for, for, for months or years, then a trial that only looks at the safety or effectiveness of the product for a few weeks isn't that helpful or that relevant. It provides, you know, obviously it provides some, some reassurance potentially, but not, not, not as helpful as some of the longer term follows up that we've tried to do in other research. But the messages from it are, is if you're using uh, topical corticosteroids on your child or yourself twice daily, there's probably no additional benefit. This evidence is strongest for when you're using stronger steroids, a moderate, potent, moderate or, or, or potent. Um, but uh, I think consensus is this probably applies to, to weaker ones like hydrocortisone as well. So if you're using it twice daily, then unless you've been specifically told to by your clinician, uh, you might want to step down to once daily. The, the strength of the steroid you use probably does match the severity of eczema in that kind of crude way that I showed you at the beginning in terms of the treatment escalator. Um, how you did is define mild model study of eczema uh, isn't well determined, but essentially, if, if with your GP, whoever's helping you look after you or, you or your child's skin, if you can agree um, what the eczema should look like, then if you match that with the, with the appropriate uh, steroid strength, then that's probably the best way to treat it. You may or may not have come across weekend therapy. Um, so this is approach, instead of uh, reacting to the skin becoming red, is instead using topical corticosteroids in a way to prevent the redness to begin with. And there are analogies here with asthma. So instead of using a reliever inhaler all the time, you use the uh, preventer inhaler uh, with a low dose of corticosteroid that prevents the asthma symptoms. And the idea is a similar one in eczema, where if you've got troublesome sites, for example, around the elbows or the, or the knees, instead of waiting for that to become red every two to three or four weeks, instead, two days out of every seven weeks, putting a little bit of corticosteroid there in a preventative way. It's called weekend therapy because it's an easy way to think about it. You know, Saturday, Sunday, put it on. Um, but it doesn't have to be, obviously, Saturday or Sunday. It can be any two consecutive days in the week. Um, this message is getting out there. But again, your GP or some of the other people you might interact with, pharmacists, may not be aware of this. But there is good evidence from that. So that, that's good to know. And again, the data isn't brilliant in terms of providing reassurance around skin thinning. Talking to that question earlier, you know, which are the best and safest to topical corticosteroids to use? Um, but despite that, what there is, is reassuring. Um, so in uh, this sort of subsample, there were 3,000 people, um, less than 1% had any evidence of skin thinning, which is a commonly reported concern. Um, so again, I think the treatment does have to be individualized to you and your child, as I say, according to the severity and the size of the eczema. But I think you can take some reassurance from this. So you're not going to get terrible problems from uh, using a topical corticosteroid in days. It's usually weeks to months, from weeks to months of continuous use. I'm going to speed up a little bit now, um, partly because the slides hopefully will take a bit less time, but also because um, I wanted to make sure we finished on time with a little bit of time for Q&A after if possible. I'm going to talk just briefly about use of antimicrobials. And when I talk antimicrobials, essentially this study was looking at use of antibiotics. Um, so uh, you may have been offered or um, used uh, an oral or a topical antibiotic on your child's skin before because uh, it may have looked like it may have become infected. Um, concern is that we probably overuse antibiotics in this situation as well as other situations such as colds and coughs and so on. This particular trial called the CREAM style trial, potentially confusing, it's just an acronym for the trial because CREAM was a nice way to say children with eczema antibiotic management study. Um, but it was actually comparing uh, placebo, so an unactive treatment with a cream, with an oral antibiotic. Um, essentially, we, we compared over 100 different children, uh, randomised the different groups who had uh, clinically, clinically infected eczema, and we, we didn't see any difference. So for the children who took part in that study, there was no additional benefit from uh, oral or topical antibiotics. Obviously, it depends a little bit on how severe the eczema was. We asked GPs to recruit children into the study. So if it was very severe and they felt they couldn't wait, you know, uh, to potentially have active treatment, they didn't come into the study. Um, but essentially, there's another message there around appropriate strength of uh, topical corticosteroids. Uh, essentially, if people stepped up treatment from, say, mild to moderate, they, they, they did well, just as well um, as anyone who got the antibiotics. 
Okay, this is a biggie, food allergies. Uh, it's a complex area, uh, and that's why we're doing research in it. Um, important things is to kind of understand the background first is that there are two main types of allergy. There's the immediate type of allergy that tends to go in a lot of press and has tragically led to deaths in young people, whereby you might get wheezing, vomiting, uh, rash, or worse, within two hours. And then there's the so-called delayed type allergy, um, which tends to be the ones that people most worry about in eczema. So what's the link between eczema and allergy? Well, again, uh, we need to do some research to try and inform our understanding of it, but we know that food allergies, immediate type food allergies are more common in children with eczema. And your child uh, or you yourself uh, may have developed a uh, food allergy because you had eczema that appeared earlier in life, say at month two or three, uh, and was more troublesome from an early on. So those are the children that are most at risk of developing it. Um, the question most parents ask GPs, or, or I, I think most commonly asked, is around whether they should have a food allergy test to guide um, their child's diet. You know, because it could it be the milk, meat, milk, wheat, egg, so on, um, that's driving, uh, causing these long-term eczema symptoms. It might be the kind of advice you know, you were given over the fence or you've picked up through social media that you should cut out X, Y, and Z. The problem is that tests are imperfect. And as I put there, are mainly used for immediate type allergy. So if actually trying to answer the question for delayed type allergy, we don't know whether they're any good. And again, if you've had conflicting advice or have sought out the information or unsure what to do on it, that's not surprising. Um, lots of parents do commonly uh, restrict their child's diet or modify it to see if it makes a difference. Um, but there are risks associated with that, either in terms of their nutrition or, um, or indeed potentially promoting allergies, food allergies. Um, if you ask different groups, so this little uh, slide here is uh, we did a survey of GPs, pediatricians, people who specialize in allergy and skin doctors, dermatologists. If you ask different groups when they would use a uh, food allergy test, when there isn't a history of a reaction to a food, Essentially, you get variation both within and across the different uh, specialities. Um, and they're not necessarily to blame. Essentially, there's no good evidence to inform their decision making. So they just go on good in their own, their own clinical experience. So something needs to be done about this. And we're trying to do this uh, through uh, the TIGER study. The TIGER study is a follow on to the test study where essentially we were so uncertain because it's such a contentious and difficult area to explore whether we could even do a trial to try and better understand whether test-guided food allergy uh, uh, diet, uh, dietary advice based on tests, food allergy tests was, was, was feasible. Um, we found that it was, so now we're just in the process of setting up the follow-on trial, the TIGER trial, which will try to answer the question of whether test-guided dietary advice improves control in children between three months and two years of age. Um, there's a, there's a, a link to the, the test study at the top and the Twitter handle that we use for that study. And, and then in the coming months, they'll move over to the Tiger study if you're interested in finding out more, or just drop us an email at the address that I give at the end. Okay, so uh, John and I have talked quite a bit. We're gonna try and help you put it all together now. So I'm gonna hand back over to John. Thanks, Matt. So um, I referred earlier to the Apache study where we, where we spoke to uh, parents and clinicians uh, about um, their experiences of eczema diagnosis and management and this was this was to pair some a piece of work around to develop a what's known as a written action plan now written action plans are individualized uh documents or they could be electronic or printed that give guidance and instructions for um for patients and parents that have been drawn up together with the with the clinician and and the uh, and the patient, so that the people go away with a clear sense of what they need to do and how they go about it. These have been used for um, previously for the treatment and the management of asthma and have been shown to work well. So we looked at whether we could develop such instruments, such tools for eczema, and uh, like I say, so the initial part was finding out about from parents and GPs, their experiences, but then moving on to what could go, what should go into it, to this kind of document? What, what's, what, what would be helpful, both for clinician and for patients and parents? Once we'd done that, we started to draft a, a, um, a written action plan, a document that, 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 that we could put to people. And we went back to the many of the participants and we put them all into a room in two different focus groups 
to help sort of define, refine, build a consensus about how, how this written action plan could work and how it could work well. And um, so if you go on to the next slide, Matt. So the things that was highlighted as important was that people, there should be um, individual action steps for maintenance and flares. So what, what's, been, what's been agreed between the doctor and the parent about what should be done, what kind of, what emollient, when the emollients or the steroids should be used, when to apply them. And if they're not working, at what point should we go back and seek medical advice? What point should we say, oh no, I need to go to the doctor here. But it was also important because some of those things around beliefs that we've highlighted about parents and GPs having different perspectives and different focus. We also thought it was important to have some general generic information about eczema, about, about the causes and the rationale for using the different treatments, what can trigger it, when, when, when it's appropriate to have um, steroid support, when it's appropriate to have um, antibiotics, but also to record the treatment preferences. One of the things that GP has highlighted is that when people come into the consultation, they don't always remember the, the treatment they previously had. So when you're working with a kind of trial and error approach, that becomes quite challenging. Another important element was signposting to further information. So often videos can be quite helpful. We, we, and um, we can, we, we, so we included a section on how to apply an emollient, the kind of volumes that, that, that should go on there. If you, if you flag up the next screen, Matt, this, this shows what our written action plan looked like, or at least, the, so there was three pages, and these are the two main pages. The third page was the, uh, the documentation of previous, um, previous treatments. So you can see there that people can fill in all these different parts. So their moisturizer, their non-soap product, there's a video link to how to application. Again, there's a video link to, you know, application in the one below. So they've got things there for uh, different elements of different parts of the body. So often people are uh, advised to use different treatments for the face and for the, for the general body. Um, and then at the bottom, you've got a timeline. So if these things aren't working for you, come back to us, as the GP saying. And uh, but give give it a go over a number of days. But but if it's not working, then come back to us. And then over on the right there, there's that um, there's that generic information, which you know people have been. It's just nice to have something to hand that kind of reinforces some of the issues that we've been talking about. People, we we talked about whether this should be download, whether this should be electronic, or whether this should be a paper thing, and. It may have moved on since we did it, but parents really like the idea of having something they could just stick on the fridge and refer to if they, if they if there was any confusion or uncertainty. And G, but for GPs, it was important that they could have this within their electronic records, fill it out, print it out, and then people could go away could go away with it. I can see there's quite a lot of in, interest in it on the chat, and uh, Matt's highlighted where it can be downloaded from. Um, so it is still available and um, hope, you know, I think that the, the power of this is it brings, it kind of reduces that gap that we highlighted between parents and GPs. It reduces the sort of the element of parents and patients, you know, older children want to be involved in this as well, I should have said, but it reduces that kind of feeling of non-involvement that, 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 that we highlighted earlier. Or it has the potential to anyway i should say um i think that's it on the written action plans matt i'll, I'll just hand back to you for the final few slides great thank you yeah, as john says so we just got three slides before we do a brief summary so one resource which isn't on that written action plan because the it's only just been launched in the last few weeks um is this eczmacareonline.org.uk um again i'm sure i've got the email address on the last slide which i'll leave up when we finished um and I promised you a, a resource that's free of bias, it's got evidence, um, and it's actually shown to work as well. So again, this is hot off the press, the results in the study aren't uh, published yet, but um, this is an online resource that you can log on to and freely use. 
um, that will cover all the different things that you might have thought about or haven't thought about in the care of your child. And it's a really nice quote there from somebody who was involved in the study where we showed that work. So a good resource to uh, go to if you need, if you'd like more information. Um, and then uh, this is another bit of ongoing work. So these trials that we've talked about have taken years of work. So I set out 10 years ago trying to undertake the, uh, the best emollients for eczema study. Um, we've got lots of other questions that need to be ans answered and we can't afford lots of trials which take a long time and cost lots of money. So colleague, I'm working with colleagues in uh, Nottingham, Centre for Evidence of Dermatology there to do this rapid eczema trials, where essentially the idea is you get uh, essentially one sort of, they call it a platform, where you have a series of trials that run out one after another quite quickly. And the key thing here is that it will be patients who will be deciding which, 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 which questions we try to answer. Uh, and obviously will be dependent on patients in a citizen science, citizen science kind of approach taking part and all these trials will be done online. Um, so it's really exciting work. So if you are interested in uh, getting involved in some way, then again, drop us a line at the email address I gave at the end. And, and uh, uh, yeah, no commitment, but uh, sign up and why don't you find out what's going on with that. And I'm going to finish, I'm afraid, a bit of a sad note. No, we can't prevent eczema. Some of you, if you uh, are local to Bristol, might have been involved in the uh, BEEP trial because um, there's good evidence that maybe get, using moisturisers early in life might prevent eczema. The trial was negative. Again, if you go to the Cochrane Library, you can find this review, which has pulled in other studies which have sought to do the same thing to find out whether we could prevent eczema by that route, and unfortunately not. So, um, uh, yeah, watch this space. There are other studies looking at potentially earlier treatment of eczema using topical corticosteroids, but emollients don't seem to help prevent it, but do continue using them as a treatment. Okay, so I'm going to try and summarise then. So a few bullet points here. So first thing is, you know, be careful of what you read or see on the internet, unless it's from a good resource like Eczema Care Online or hopefully our resources. Um, if you're going to focus on what's best for you or your child's skin, then think about these two treatments you use well. Find a moisturiser that you or moisturisers uh, that you and your child are happy to use, uh, and get some advice so you can feel safe and confident about the use of topical corticosteroids. Um, the resources we've highlighted encourage you to have a look at those, whether it's the written action plan that John's just talked about, the decision aid that I mentioned earlier around moisturisers in the Eczema Care Online resource. And there are a few things that you could probably stop doing and not bother with um, if you're using them. So uh, uh, not using bath additives. Uh, antibiotics probably won't help unless you've got you know, really good going clinical infection. And at the moment, um, try, and be, try and be as inclusive in your child's diet as possible, unless, of course, they've got already established, got you know, an immediate type allergy. Um, uh, but the TIGER trial will give us more information in a few years. And if you feel inspired in some way to join us, um, because I've, as I've said, I've tried to make it clear throughout that the thing that's run throughout this is uh, patient involvement in our trials, uh, then let us know and you can come and join us. Um, so as promised, there's the, uh, uh, the the two key website addresses there, xmacaronline.org.uk, and then the Bristol one will take you to the moisturiser decision aid in the EWAP. Um, you can drop us a line at the university through that email address. Uh, I'm on Twitter, as is John. Um, and I think we've got a few minutes spare to try and pick up the questions. So I guess I'll look to, uh, does that sound all right, Helen? Yeah, that's great. And thanks both of you for a really um, fascinating series of uh, slides and um, presentations. And hopefully that's been really helpful for um, everyone who's joined us today. So, yeah, Matt, if you want to, um, there, are, there have been a couple of questions popped into the chat. I'm happy to try and pick those out if you want, or if you want to have a look. Yeah, at them. no, I'll I'll, uh, I'll pick them off if that's right. So we, yeah, we, good. we can get. So I'll keep it fairly fairly brief. Obviously, we can't give individualized it, it, advice, but you know, if you haven't come across the written action plan, then then why don't you download it and take it along to your GP the next time you go in? Um, so uh, thank you for your questions, Anna. So one was around use of a bleach bath. So if you've not come across this for children who do have uh, troublesome, particularly recurrently infected eczema. Um, uh, uh, sometimes dermatologists recommend the use of bleach in the bath. So obviously you have to be a bit careful about this because you don't want to burn, uh, cause a chemical burn to your child's skin from uh, an inappropriate uh, bleach or quantity. Um, but uh, again, this is personal experience. I had, I did try this with my own children when they were young uh, and their children was troublesome. A couple of cupfuls of Milton into a bath 
seem to work for me. There is some limited evidence around its effectiveness, and there is an information leaflet on, uh, I'm pretty sure it's the National Eczema Society website that gives you a bit more guidance. So obviously caution about what detergent you're using and at what strength, but if you follow the advice on there, um, uh, you, you may find that helpful. Uh, next question is around uh, which potency is steroid for weekend therapy. I'm not aware there's good evidence around that. Again, it may be that if you ask your um, uh, healthcare professional about this, they may not be aware of it. Certainly dermatology specialists will be, but not all GPs will be. Um, uh, it probably has to be in discussion with them. Uh, again, if you're getting mild or eczema, probably match it with a milder steroid. Um, I think dermatologists' view is that in primary care, we're, we're much too scared of, of moderate potency. They feel that hydrocortisone maybe for lots of people doesn't add anything. So, so uh, it may be that a moderate potency, something like Umivate, you might have heard of that, it is, is appropriate. But I think that's a, an individual discussion with uh, with whoever advises you on that, because obviously they'll they'll need to prescribe it accordingly. Um, thank you for the comments around the written action plan. That's really um, gratifying, um, but really reflects, I think, the patient involvement we have and the good work that John uh, and our colleagues did um, getting that document uh, right on the on, on you know on what people were telling us. Um, and I've popped the address in there. It's the same one as is on the slide that I find it. Um, have I missed anything? Uh, Joanne says, are you looking for public involvement? Now that with eczema, please do drop us a line. Yes, our work, uh, as you would have seen, is um, I'm going to unshare the screen now. If that's if that's all right. Um, our work, as you will have seen there, is uh, focused on, on children, but particularly the Rapid Eczema trial program that I've talked about and colleagues that I am working with, for example, in London, are uh, uh, are trying to do you know some research to help uh, adults with eczema. Um, unfortunately, you may have been told either yourself as a child or for your own children, uh, or, you know, you, your child will grow out of it. Uh, a fair proportion will outgrow eczema, but uh, up to one in 10, uh, or, or more will will we'll have persistent eczema. And so if that's if that's the story for you, then yes, there is there is a a need for more research. So again, drop drop us a line, uh, whether you're volunteering for yourself or, or you and your child, and uh, and we'll put you in touch with people who um who are leading on research uh, in that direction. Um just looking to see if I've missed any other questions in there. Helen, can you see anything that I've missed? Or John, anything you want to come in as kind of closing remarks that um no nothing nothing more from me i don't think matt i mean it's i like you it, it, i was it's nice to see the uh feedback on the written action plan um yeah yeah, yeah that's good okay shall we close it there helen shall i let you sort of finish this off oh we've got the email address back up hold on i'll do that in a minute while you uh while you sort of close things down helen yeah, thanks, Matt. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just once again, thanks very much to um, to Matt and to John for their excellent um, presentations today. And to all of you, thank you for joining us and for your questions and engaging with our research. Um, if you would like to keep up to date with um, what we're doing in this area, um, you can use the contact details that Matt provided and more generally, um, you can sign up to our newsletter and to find out about our research more generally. And the link to that is on our homepage on our website, which is www.bristol.ac.uk forward slash C-A-P-C, CAPC. Um, I did put that in the chat right at the start. Uh, and I think that's pretty much it. Um, we will be running uh, more webinars in this series um, focusing on other of our main research areas. So again, as I say, probably the best way to uh, keep posted on that is to sign up for our newsletter and also follow us on Twitter if you're on Twitter on um, at CAPC Bristol at C-A-P-C B-R-I-S-T-O-L. That's it, I think. So thanks very much, everybody. And hopefully we will we will see you again. Yeah, thank you everyone for your time. And thank, thank you, Helen, for organising for John to joining me. It's a real, real, real pleasure and uh, can't see, see you, but, I, but thank you for coming. <laughs> yeah, Bye thanks now. everyone.